Okay, everyone. Hello, John Haddad, uh, technical evangelist over at Data Stacks. Um, I don't know if you might know me on uh, Twitter as Rusty Razorblade. Um, today we're going to be talking. Uh, this is a crash course in Cassandra, so we're going to keep it short. But I'm going to try and pack as much information as I can in. If I'm going too fast, please raise your hand. Stop me. I don't want anyone to get lost. I don't want to keep ranting or speaking too. Um, we're going to go over, uh, look at it from the top down, starting at the cluster as a whole, and then breaking it down piece by piece into smaller components. So, <clears throat> to start, this is our high level architecture. Cassandra is a giant hash ring. This is in contrast to a lot of other types of databases where they achieve scalability by using master slave architecture. You don't have that concept here. Um, there's only one type of server. Every node in the cluster performs the same duty. It answers queries. It takes writes. There's no configuration server. There's no um, region manager or uh, anything like that. It's all just a ring, and data is distributed throughout the ring, hopefully evenly. Um, as a result of this, there's no single point of failure, which is pretty cool. Uh, you don't have to worry about handling failover, uh, master of slave promotion, leader election, things like that. That's just not a concern here. Um, primarily, the two goals that Cassandra was built on top of are high availability and linear scalability. So everything, every single design decision, core design decision, was built with this in mind. So things that may seem a little bit weird. Um, or different from previous databases that you may have used before. They're built with a single goal of this works well with three servers, and this also works well with 300 servers. <coughs> um, from the ground up, built with multi PC in mind. So this is part of our high availability thing. We've got, let's say, a data center on the West Coast, data center on the East Coast, three in Europe, one in South America. It was built for this specific purpose. It's the only database I've seen that did this early on, and as a result, works really, really well when you have an entire region. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that because of the way it works as a hash rate, you're always going to find data by the key. So whatever your primary key is, that's how you're going to look up whatever you're looking for. Um, and I'll go a little bit more into detail on a little bit how that works, kind of what that means when you're modeling it. Um, and it runs on the JVM, so you've got the, uh, you know, you've got uh, garbage collection, you've got JVM tuning. Um, so if you're familiar with that already, this is good. If not, if you're familiar with it, there's a lot of material out there. Um, we can see here, this is an example of a hash ring. Uh, data will be distributed evenly throughout the six nodes in this cluster. Um, this is how clusters were traditionally set up. So a ring would get part of a slice of data right here, and that's the data that it's responsible for. Uh, newer versions of Cassandra, it's broken into smaller chunks. The data is distributed, instead of having a big chunk of data here, it's distributed all around. <coughs> it makes certain operations a little bit easier. Um, that part really isn't too significant right now. We can think of the ring the same either. So let's talk a little bit about hash ring. Um, data lives, basically, uh, you'll have a primary key for a particular uh, row or partition, and that's going to hash to a particular point in this ring, and you basically move forward, and that's the primary location that your data is going to live on. Your data is also going to be uh, copied to additional replicas. So this is where you have your replication path. So if you say RF equals three, your data is going to live on three of these servers. Now none of them are the master. There's just a there's just one server that's picked as the initial replica, and then other replicas are picked depending on some of the rules that you set up. Uh, you can tell Cassandra to be rack aware. You can say be EC2 aware. In that case, it will do its best to not put 
two copies of your data in the same availability zone or in the same rack. So in the case that you have a rack failure or uh, there's a failure on Amazon, it's totally fine in your cluster will stay up. <clears throat> so when choosing high availability, there's always going to be some trade-offs. Because we want this thing to be able to be highly available in a single data center and multi data centers, the concession that we make is we choose to give up consistency when there are problems with network partitions and there's problems with um, sorry, mm -hmm. with the network partitions and, and the servers being um, You have per query, you have a tunable consistency so that you can say if I have an RF, is, uh, my replication factor is three and I'm looking for information, I can say it's okay that this information is a little out of date. Just give me whatever whatever comes back from the cluster, that's totally fine. Uh, the first server to return some of that data, that I'll, I'll take that as the result. You can also put up your consistency level and you can say quorum. I want two out of three to agree upon what the right answer is to my query. Or you can say, I want all the machines to agree on the answer to this particular query. So you can be really strongly consistent and give up availability, or you can be kind of consistent, pretty consistent, and have way higher ability. Um, an example, uh, the, my last company, we ran uh, all our queries at Quorum, and we were at Amazon, and we had our data split across three availability zones. We actually had an entire uh, availability zone fail due to a network error, and we lost a third of our cluster, and we actually had zero downtime as a result because we ran everything out of Quorum. So two out of three were still there, and everything was totally fine. Yep. So the quorum is a simple majority of the replica um, or space you are. So for quorum, is that uh, customizable or is it just a simple majority? <coughs> quorum is going to be a simple majority. Um, but you can query, there, there's other uh, query consistencies. I just didn't list all of here. Like you can query, you can query any one, two, um, and then within your DCs, you can query for global. So you can actually have it query other data centers as well, or you can just say stay in this one data center for performance reasons. Yep. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you can have tunable consistency levels uh, on reads, right? But is it actually also on, on yes. writes? Or yep. So one of the slides I'm going to get into kind of shows how that consistency works on both sides. Anything else? So the most can be copied with different regions. You can, you can do multiple regions, yeah. So you can, Cassandra's built so that instead of thinking about it as one giant cluster, within each, let's say, Amazon region, you would have a cluster, and then you'd have a cluster in west and a cluster in east, and they talk to each other. So when you do a write, you can say, I want a local forum, and in this case it would mean, let's say you have a nine node cluster, you do replication back to three, or you have two, two nine node clusters, two out of the three agree over here under local forum, and then asynchronously, the data is replicated over to this data center. So that's kind of how you get the high availability. That's how you have partition tolerance because you don't need a, a network connection between the two data centers to continue to function. Can you use it to do that Effectively, yeah. It, it, it's one cluster, but two data centers. So your data is replicated between all of them. So it, it's, it's one single cluster. It's, it's one cluster um, with multiple DCs. Uh, yes? Um, the choice of the key with the hashes, is there the possibility that it can get skewed? So, <coughs> by default, uh, we use the Vermer 3 partitioner, uh, which has a really good distribution. So it's not like a, there is actually, that problem existed um, if you use the old, one of the old partitioners, and it just looked at the raw bytes, and it put it into the row in a location. So if all of your keys are the same prefix, you could end up with a massive skew. But that's not the case anymore. Anything else? So I'm going to talk a little bit about the data structures. Now that we have an idea of how the ring works, at a very, very high level, I'll get into a little bit of the details on the data structures. Um, similar uh, to relational database, we have tables. Uh, that's kind of where 
the similarities in. Um, you can see the hierarchy. The top level is key space that provides a level of isolation for a bunch of tables. Uh, within a table, you have partitions, and within partitions, you have rows. Um, you use a language called CQL to create your tables and query your data. CQL effectively gives you uh, a query language similar to SQL, which is very flexible um, from a table creation standpoint and effectively allows you to have a schema database um, while still getting the benefits of a new system. Uh, the partition key is the first part of your primary key which determines where the data is found in this ring. So in a simple scenario, which I'm going to get into next, um, if you just have a, part a single partition key, let's say it's a user ID, your data will move in one, your data will hash to a point in that ring based on the user ID and that's where it goes. Uh, there's something called clustering keys, which allows you to put multiple rows inside a single partition. Now, the important thing to note here is that a partition is really similar to how a row would exist in a relational database where everything is together. Um, the benefits of the uh, clustering key is that you can make multiple rows appear uh, next to each other on disk for performance reasons. I'll kind of all get into an example of how that works. So, as I mentioned, we have our user system, which is, in this case, identified by name. This is a really simple data model. I don't recommend you use name as a primary key. Um, so we've got me, an evangelist. We have Luke, also an evangelist. I think he's 33. Uh, we have some old guy named Old Pete, Steven Seagal, and John Claude Van Uh To create this table, we have a relatively straightforward uh, create table statement. This is really similar to what you're going to see in any relational database. Um, so it's pretty familiar. Um, because we only have this listed as our primary key, this is our partition key. And as a result, that's going to control where in the hash ring this table is. So you know, if you do select where you're looking for John Claude Van Damme, you know where in the ring that belongs. So you don't have to query every node. If you have 100 nodes in your cluster, you only have to look at one. Um, how does it line? What's that? How does it line? How does the application look which one is going to Sure. Um, we're going to do that in a little bit, but what I'll tell you now is that on a read, you can query any node in the cluster, and the cluster will, that acts as a coordinator, and will find the right node to talk to. So it looks at your key, it says, where's John Claude Van Damme? Ashes it, knows exactly where it is goes to the right node, and it sends back the data. So, the data goes from node X to Y. Can you repeat the question? So, the data goes from the node where the data is, to the node that I'm connected to. Right. Yeah. You can avoid that by using, um, if you're using the Java driver or the Python driver, you can actually use token aware strategy, and when you perform a query, we'll go to the right node. Like every time do I have to go to this, or is the login table and can be gone back to the client? That, that's, that's what I was just talking about with the driver. So the driver, uh, if you're using the data stacks, uh, Java driver or the Python driver, um, most of the ones that are current right now will go to the correct node. They'll basically say, John Cloud Van Dam, Murmur 3, they'll apply the hash to it, and they actually know the ring topology, and they'll go to the right node. Then you don't have to have the overhead of sending the data through the cluster twice. So the driver uh, aware of the topology. So the, the client, um, <coughs> if you want to take the token aware stuff, yes, the, the client would be aware of that. But the client already exists. It's not anything that you would have to do. It's like it's it's within the driver. Order. I don't know how to use it. Uh, I, what was the I, question? If Hector or uh, Osteonics support token aware strategy. It would not surprise me because they're under active development still, um, but I don't think it would do it. So, the CQL driver we send is batches, but the batch is during the token awareness request, so the batch could have different tokens in it. Should we separate into different batches for each token? Um, if you're sending, okay. Batches are useful in limited circumstances. Um, they're only going to be useful on writes, and they're going to do the same. If you don't need uh, a batch log, like if you don't need to say that all these things get applied or, or they don't, um, you wouldn't bother with batches. I 
can get into batches in a little bit, but I think, yeah, once I cover the main material, if we have time, I'm happy to um, But the short answer mm -hmm. is you don't have to use batches. It would be faster to go to each one. <coughs> so when you have multiple rows in a partition, this is actually where Cassandra uh, is extremely useful. This is uh, used in a lot of time series data. Uh, we are collecting a lot of data around a specific point with a sensor or something like that where you say, I always want to get, let's say, the, the last thousand sensor readings. Right? Um, this is a very, very simplified example. Let's say that we have a photo system and people can comment on the photos. And we know that we always want to query by a particular photo. Um, so we know that we always have a photo like that. And when you create this table, you effectively give it a photo ID and a comment ID. Photo ID is going to be your partition key. Comment ID is going to be your cluster key. What this does is it means that all of the comments for a particular photo are stored together on disk. So if you have a million photos, hitting the first thousand is not going to be that big of a deal. Compare this with a relational database or something like Mongo or really anything else, your data is going to be spread across a lot of different sections of disk. If you go to pick the first thousand, first it has to, it has to look up those, you may have an index on your uh, photo ID, it has to look at your index, and then it has to go out to disk and do hundreds of thousands of reads if your data is not already in there. So the goal here is to reduce the number of queries that you have to do, the amount of work that the database has to do to answer a question. Um, <clears throat> this I have here, there's only two partitions. So even though there's four rows, there's only one, there's only going to be two records, two partitions in your cluster. Um, in this example. So we actually store the actual fork of the binary table in the cluster, or would it be somewhere else? I'm sorry, I'm not We actually store the fork of the binary table in the cluster, or would it be somewhere else? Store the binary. I mean, actually, you can make it a JPEG. Oh, you, you could. Um, Cassandra wasn't built as like a initially as a giant binary store. So you want you want to avoid having a file or uh, columns that have more than um, you know a few things in them. So if there are, there's actually uh, a really good um, project called Pythos, I think it is, which is an S3 wire compatible object store built on top of the same. You, you can yep, you can do it, um, but the thing that you have to be wary of is storing too much data in a single row or in a single partition. If you go above 100 megs, you start to have performance problems. Yes. Um, this is a great table comment. I know it's just an example, yep. but it brought up an idea, uh, something that I actually used a statement like that. The reason I say is, if comment ID is only, you only get that with a comment, right? So is that, does that imply that when you create the table, you're going to add something to the table that I already have the ID? Good question. So I used IDs as integers here because it's too big to use UUIDs. Right. You do not, like with Cassandra, you don't want to use uh, integers. Basically, counting anything is really hard to distribute the system. You effectively have to introduce locking, and it just sucks. <laughs> So what you do here is you would actually generate, if you put in a new comment, you would generate a UUID in the client, and that's what you would assume. Yeah, great question. Yep. So this pretty much assumes that you're going to query them by your partition or primary key. If you're going to query by say one and all pictures that were posted by you. Exactly. So what you would do in that case is you would set up a second, uh, second table with the name as the partition key and the comment or and they'll give it the full comment or just the comment ID as your cluster key. So uh, sorry, not, not the full comment as the cluster key, just have the comment ID as the cluster key. And then you can either add additional all the information into that. If you want to have if you want to do one query and say give me all Luke's comments, you get them all back. Um, or you can just put the IDs and then you have to go to the comment table in order to find them. But it's the physical data then is still clustered by in the second table of Wiki. In the second table, if you were to do user uh, and comment ID, if you just wanted all the comments, uh, then it would be the partition key would be the 
user, and the plugin key would be equivalent for the, the comment that you find. So you effectively break the data points. And this is actually one of the things you mind about Sandra is because of querying capabilities, are limited to things that scale well, you end up writing your data multiple times. Okay. Okay. One of the things that we'll talk about a little bit is the looking half and why writes with Cassandra are so fast. Literally the fastest of any database that you're going to look at. Writes are so fast that it's actually cheaper to do a whole bunch of writes and then make your reads faster than try and do like one write and skate around limitations of blocking and things like that and then do more complex reads. And I would imagine there's some sort of, if you're duplicating the data, then there's integrity controls, so you don't ever have a situation. You, so there, there, the, the batch question that was asked earlier over here, this is one of the, the tools that you use to avoid integrity problems. Okay. Um, but when you're designing your schemas, you want to keep in mind that it's possible <clears throat> that you might have data center in west and data center in east, and it's very, very possible that the link between the two will get severed, and the two systems will continue to run independently. When the link comes back, the data gets replicated. So that's kind of the that, that's that trade-off of consistency. It's, I want my system to be up, but they might not be talking to each other. So, uh, but you were saying you were uh, you were writing the data twice uh, in regards to the specific query. Did you mean that you were writing the data in two different formats? Yes. Two different publishing formats? Exactly. You, okay. you, so you're not just duplicating the data, you're duplicating, you're actually not duplicating the structure, you're writing Right. You, yeah. What you're going to do is write, um, and this eventually comes up, but when you're doing data modeling in Cassandra, <coughs> you denormalize for performance reasons. You always query by the partition key, and as a result of that, you may take the same data and have three different views into it, and effectively just write out three different tables. Not a problem. Um, and again, that trade off is. I'm going to use a little bit more storage, but on my reads are going to be a hell of a lot faster because I just don't have to do a lot of this. Since we're carrying multiple copies of the data, so there's no uh, concept of updating. Okay. There is. There is no update. Then you have to update all the copies. You have to update all the copies. That, that's, kind of, that's kind of where that trade off of uh, do you want to copy all of your data or do you want to copy only some of it? For instance, in a lot of the systems that I've worked with, I've just gone ahead and copied the IDs around. That way, if I update the data, it doesn't really matter. I don't have to update everything. So I might not store all of my comments in the user to comment table. I might not store the actual comment text in the case it's updated. I would only store a comment ID and then go look up the photo in the comment. Would you sacrifice the speed of query? In that case, yeah, that's the trade off. So again, it's, it's how much work is it to do it in your application versus how much time you want to save. It may be worth it. But keep in mind, if you're doing queries in parallel, and I fetch 20, let's say I want my comments, I get 20 comment IDs, I can do those 20 queries in parallel against Cassandra and get my answer back pretty quickly. So it's always, there's always going to be a trade off. A thousand rows, you probably don't want to do a thousand rows. So in the young people, and also we have a lot of people So you never update up the mm -hmm. The only thing that changes is what they call data containers. So Adding the changes as mm -hmm. you it. So then there is no need to update everything. So is that methodology should be should better here? Um it depends on the kind of your workload, honestly. Like if you're if you're dealing with a content system, you can make it so that you never do updates. You just have to model your data in that fashion. Um, but Cassandra does support updates and they're they're not a problem. I would imagine if you're some requirements and design, it's probably not that big of an issue because I would imagine that you know, most of us find that data is accessed in a particular way, which is why you have keys and all that. So exactly. It's probably not as big of an issue. It occurs where you have to duplicate data and deal with that, not, not on a normal scenario. Yeah, most of the time you're not doing ad hoc random queries. Uh, in this, at least in the system that I've worked in, uh, we have a predictable number of queries that we're going to do. We know that we always are going to find comments on whatever or on something or, or whatever. And that's really what we're optimizing for here. And there's very, very few updates, especially if it's a content system. Or if you're looking at, like, again, sensor data, you're not going back and updating your sensor data. It's time series. It's in the past. You can't change it. Is it columnar storage? Underneath, yes. Okay. Uh, that's a good idea. 
that uh, generally most of the distributed systems are designed uh, for the thing when you don't need to get the data before like the update of data. Because if you do that, you get into the problems of data access. Uh, one node updating the data and another one over the wrong data. So it's really not suggested for any of the distributed systems that way. It's and then Cassandra is typically uh, specifically mentions that uh, it's designed for that use case where you don't need to get the Yeah, that, that was the primary use case that it was built for. Um, but it doesn't limit you in terms of what you can do with the data. Because like if you really wanted to, you could throw in a, some external locking mechanism if you really, really needed that. But the reality is 98, 99% of the time, unnecessary. But then you use the advantage of Cassandra, which is a very high Right. If if you if you had an external locking system, okay. yes. yeah, then Cassandra may not be the right tool for you. Um, Can you repeat the question on uh, some people? Yes, sorry about that. Uh, I forgot what the original question was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, how do you optimize for uh, range queries? Is there a concept of ordering? How do you optimize for range queries? Good question. Um, so, right here, the, uh, this is really nothing uh, particularly useful, but let's assume it still was an integer. Uh, the comment ID here controls the order. So this will actually be stored one, two, three on disk in that order. So if you want to do a range, it's already stored in order. I, I think your point is, I think if you're trying to have a hash map or tree map, so the, the Partition key, which is like the physical primary key, says the row, the columns are in order on disk. So you can search them by order. And so you think they go on disk, uh, you look up at the partition key, which is sort of like the physical primary key, and then the column uh, that this, this which explains this? the data model better. You, you understand the physical layout. Yeah, I can't repeat all that. <laughs> <laughs> um, just a second. So, yes, to. to Answer this. Think of it on disk like this. You have your photo ID, and then you have all of your comments, and they're stored in order of your cluster. So, is the grammar for your database mission, is the primary key, the partition key, the command cluster key, or is it the composite of the computer? It's the first one uh, is, sorry, the question was in the data model, what's the partition key, what's the cluster key, how do we tell? Uh, if we look at, if we look back at our Original data model. If there's only, and this is a little, a little confusing at first. Um, this is uh, going to be only the first thing right here is going to be your partition. Okay, this could be a tuple. So if you had a set of parentheses and it was around this, an extra set of parentheses, this whole thing would be the partition. And to get this data, you'd actually have to look it up by both photo ID and comment ID. Because that whole part, that both keys now, come into place of where everything sits uh, in your cluster. And the partition keys always get shared across the nodes, and the partition keys always stay on the disk. What more time? Is the partition key how is how the uh, hash name is spread across the nodes, and the cluster key always stay on the disk? Yes. So the, the partition keys, plural, are where it sits in the hash ring, and the cluster keys uh, determine the rows ordering inside that partition. Why is it called binary key? What's that? Why is it called binary key? Um, which part? Oh, I guess oh, the okay. <coughs> oh because, because this, the whole thing uniquely identifies it. Okay. Right. So, photo ID, comma ID do uniquely identify with the, the comma key. Yes? Is there a sort of uh, secondary Okay, the question is, is there a concept of secondary indexes? Yes, but truthfully, you do not want to use them in production. They suck. Um, um, when you do, so secondary indexes uh, in Cassandra right now actually go against the uh, uh, the performance, um, basically the, the, the linear scalability. Effectively, when you issue a query against a secondary index, and you issue it globally, it's going to query every node in the cluster. So if you've got 100 nodes, 100 nodes are now involved in your query. That's just a ton of data to work with. Uh, the reason is because secondary indexes are managed by each node 
and they manage their own data. So when each when a node gets a write, it goes, well, I got to update my address. So it's not like a, a global index where you know which server you go to, you get to query everything, and it's terrible. So do not use it. It's my, it's my advice. Yes? That that is, are you talking about in the context of secondary indexes or just in general? Uh, the question that he made is about binary files. Okay, he's asking if you put binary files in Cassandra, will they be replicated? Right. Whatever you put in Cassandra will be replicated. There's only the concept of of rows. There's not a it's not a, a object store. That's what that Githos thing that I mentioned. It will use Cassandra uh, to store data, but it will store it as if it was text or blog or whatever, and it will be replicated just like everything else. So there, it's not, there's no separate way to store files. <clears throat> Anything else? So this gets us into the right path of how Cassandra works. Um, <coughs> let's give the client, and let's go ahead and talk to you one of the servers. The server that it's talking to, it's got a number 10, this acts as the coordinator. This is kind of what I was talking about before, where you don't have to uh, know which node you're talking to, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the coordinator will go ahead and it will talk to the correct service for you. When you do a write, you get to choose the consistency level. This is what I was talking about before. You can say, acknowledge, acknowledge success only when X number of nodes have received a response. Yes? So, if you use a token aware policy, it will, the node of choose will be the right one. It won't have to. Correct. If you use the token aware policy, it will talk to the right node. Yes, one. What's that? Most of the time, uh, most of the time, if we talk to the right node, mm -hmm. uh, we can see. Yeah, there, there are, generally, yeah. yeah, there are cases where if the load is under, or if the node is under high load, um, or on, obviously unavailable, it will talk to a different node. Yes. So write means insert and then updates. Both. Both. So in Cassandra, uh, inserts and updates are in the leads effectively are the same thing. Uh, you can you can do an update on a partition or on a row that doesn't even exist, and it will actually insert the row. They're they're equivalent. Um, but when I read next time, how do I know that I'm going to move it there? So that that's where uh, query consistency. So I'll, I'll, I have the right path coming up after this. Um, and we can get it. So if you somebody considers the gateway or the road to the make a what is the token of it? Excuse me? When should somebody or an option where I say I already want to use the token of it architecture or is there a specific scenario where I use the gateway in the So this this node that you're talking to is always a coordinator, whether or not it's a uh, it, it owns it owns the data. It's always a coordinator. Okay. Whoever you're talking to is the coordinator for that application. I can is there a group of nodes to be coordinated or is it scalability work? Any any node can be a coordinator. Well, so you can use literally you can connect any single of your cluster perform a query and if it can satisfy that consistency level, it will return. So um, yes, and if you're talking to the token aware, if you're using token aware, then it will go ahead and we'll talk to one of the nodes that own that token, which reduces the amount of network overhead that you have to worry about. Yes? I can connect with any node. So when I click, I connect to a specific node because that was provided a server name I get this or something. Right. So how do we make sure that the client is distributing the connections to all of all? When you, when you use the, uh, the either the Java or the Python uh, driver that's going to that I've had experience with, um, they handle it for you. So you, you create a cluster object and you point to one of the servers, it will actually get the information about the entire cluster and then it will handle the connections. So I have a virtual name or something like that? Uh, you, you just want to point to one machine or three machines or what, what, just a, a few machines and it will go ahead and it will find the rest. It will learn the information about the ring and it will handle connection pooling, it will talk to the right server, you don't have to worry about any of this stuff. It's literally just, you just throw queries at it and it will go ahead and browse into the right ones. Yes, how common is it to do the load that one should be done? Not common, you should not do it. Do not put, the question is, do not put, uh, do you want to put a load balancer in front? Because putting a load balancer in front uh, adds a single point of failure. 
points. Now, now you have your load balancer as a point failure. The client does the load balancer. Never put a load balancer. <laughs> how does the load that, how does the client mitigate single point failure if you point to a single this is where you're at full name. That's where you point to a few. Point to three or four. So you can please you just, you just point to a few. Uh, the question was, how does it avoid single point of failure? You point to a few nodes. Ten if you want, twenty, doesn't matter. It'll, it will go ahead, it will find one, it will run the rest of the cluster, and it'll load balancer. Not a good idea. People have tried it, they'll just really figure out. So when you learn the load cluster as a will it create connections to all the nodes? <coughs> it will do it on demand as it needs to. So it will not just go ahead and open up a thousand sockets, it will wait until it needs to talk to those nodes. Again, manage them internally. Smart enough in there that if it's talking to the A and that one goes down in the middle, it'll yes, it is. Sort of. It is smart enough where it will know that it needs to talk to other servers. Totally fine. Um, let me just uh, wrap these up and then uh, hopefully we can finish this up because I'm stepping on my own time actually. <laughs> um, so the right path. Um, the reason why Cassandra is so fast is because when you write to Cassandra. It only writes to a commit log and to memory. So you're basically bound by the speed of your disk as far as how fast you can write to it without doing the disk seeking. Uh, writes are actually matched up and uh, fsync only uh, by default every 10 seconds. Um, you can actually change that if you want your data to be a lot more durable, but most people don't because if you have three copies of your data, the odds of all three machines dying are very low. So it's way faster not to fsync. <clears throat> the mem table data structure that's in memory will periodically be flushed to disk as an SS table. SS tables are immutable data files. Because of the nature of Cassandra, you can actually have one partition spread across multiple SS tables. For performance reasons, SS tables are compacted. So you'll have, let's say you have two uh, SS tables, they'll be merged together into one table. The partitions uh, will be together. So effectively, what the goal is to keep the number of disk seeds to a minimum on reads. And as well as writes. <clears throat> um, one thing to keep in mind, the leaks are a special case of the write operation. They're written as a tombstone. Because if this is a distributed system, it's possible that a node may not see a delete at some point in time if it was down or something like that. Uh, the delete, the tombstone just says, there is no data here. <clears throat> this will come in handy when we start to take a look at the recap. Yes? Yes. The you want to put separate Yes. 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 So the, the mem tables, okay, the question is, why is there a commit log and mem tables? Uh, no, actually, oh. if I increase that frequency, so let's say I, I don't do that here. <coughs> okay. It's not flushed that often. So the question is, what do you gain from flushing SS tables very frequently, or for the commit log? Uh, the SS tables. Okay. The mem tables. I, I was talking about flushing the commit log, the SS tables. Oh, the VF table, the SS table is, is flushed as a function of the amount of frame memory that's available. Mm -hmm. So as, okay. as, like as, as they get bigger in size, they get flushed to this. You can actually have an SS table that sits in memory for weeks and is not flushed to this. But when... Um, so if I back to the commit log, that doesn't move to this immediately. That has a buffer. The, the commit log has, by default, a 10 second buffer. Uh -huh. uh, well, it, it writes to it, but it won't have sync. So, so it won't force it to this. Just for almost that is time that I send on the right. Yes. Then uh, let's say I have an application for the okay. I just wrote uh, three nodes into memory. I didn't write anything in this. You wrote it to the commit log. When you commit log. Yes. The question was, will your data be written to disk when you issue the query? The answer is it depends <coughs> on how you have your server configured. If you want, you can go ahead and you can test it on every right and we'll do it on every right. Totally up to you. For performance reasons, much faster to just say that 10 second window is cool, but the commit log on a separate disk in your data file somewhere else. That way, compaction does not interrupt the commits. Got it. Thank cool. you. Did everyone get that? Awesome. Oh,
What's that? <coughs> Do I have a slide for what? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I should approach you. I could post them, I guess. Yeah. Um, yes, the slides will be available, I promise. Um, so, uh, I mentioned that MEM tables are flushed to disk as SS tables. Uh, as I said, immutable data files, deletes, written as tombstones. Um, everything that gets written has a timestamp. Basically, if my Cassandra does a read, if it gets back two different answers from two different servers, it takes along the most recent timestamp. This is instead of something like vector blocks. It just says last write wins, whatever. Um, so as, as I mentioned, a partition uh, can be spread across multiple SS tables, and that's where the compaction comes in, merges everything together, makes it nice and fast. Uh, and as a note, uh, because we were talking about uh, updates before, there is uh, two compaction strategies. Um, there's one called, the default is called size tier compaction, and that's good for when your system is only doing uh, writes and never updates, or only doing inserts and not updates. There's another one called level compaction, that's really good in the case of like high do frequent updates, um, different types of content systems. Effectively, it's going to be by your work. It does not issue a delete. No. The question, the question was, does an update issue a delete answer no. It, it will literally just write another one. So you could actually have the same uh, the same row in two different SS tables, and during compaction, it will take the one that's the newest. It will just look at the time When you do compaction, it will destroy the yeah, it will, it, whatever is the this, if there's, if there's a conflict, it keeps the newest one, throws away the rest. Uh, okay. So that's it. <coughs> well, that's an update. It's an update. No, I can Effectively. Um, one thing that's really cool about this, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever had a really large uh, database, like in MySQL or something like that. Backups, huge pain. Um, what's nice about this is, you can actually back up the SS tables as they're written to disk, and that's a perfectly legitimate backup system. Because they're compacted, it, it, because they're never written again, you literally just have to back up the files uh, after they've uh, been moved to identify um, as uh, going on the process of mobile. So there's actually a nice utility which will back up all of your SS tables in S3 automatically. You just turn it on, and you get backups, and maybe you write like, Let's say a 10 meg SS file, and that's the only thing that's updated, even though you might have a 50 terabyte cluster. <coughs> so let's start with the green half. Uh, this is, we only have a couple slides left. Um, basically, it's the same deal as the right half. It's any server be clear, it's the coordinator. Um, and again, if you have tokenware, it will go to the right node. Um, as I mentioned, the same uh, row or partition across multiple SS tables, all that's read in, merged together. Because of the nature of SS tables, you're going to have to do minimal number of seats still. So even if you've got, let's say, you ask for a thousand things, that might be spread across a handful of SS tables. So those reads are still going to be passed. Um, and one other thing that's important to note is this thing called read repair. Uh, if you're querying at a consistency level less than all, which is going to be all the time because it's crazy to do it otherwise, um, there is a chance, 10% chance by default, that that node will go ahead and query all the other nodes that have that particular piece of data and determine if it is in fact the most updated one in the query. If it's not, it will go ahead and do a diff and send the right version out. So effectively, this is that eventually consistent thing. Query at one, it's got old data, you get the old data back in the background, it will repair itself. So eventually, it's consistent. Excuse me? The question is do all nodes use the same disk? No. Each, each node is an individual server. And on that note, we never want to put this on a SAM or an NAS. Right? That's what your company uses. Commodity hardware, uh, SSDs if possible, if not, create a couple of uh, SATA drives together. Or, um, again, no, this is going to depend on your workload, which one's best. 
Yeah. So the uh, read repair is it only triggered by query or you know because you mentioned that re read repair is only when you query the data. Yes. Will it happen by itself as well? Read repair happens on its own. Okay. So it's not triggered by its query data. Right? Correct. You don't have to do anything. Okay. It, if you perform a read, there is you, you can say 100 percent of the time you would read repair, and it will asynchronously in the background go ahead and talk to the other servers that have that partition key. You go ahead. and and fix itself. If but if I it, never query that partition key, then it will then it, it doesn't need to update. It doesn't need to do it. It does not, yeah. It won't do anything. There, there is a um, utility called no tool and uh, there's a repair option. And it will go ahead and look at every single node, every single key in the cluster and repair. Otherwise it otherwise it won't do it. If you're not reading the data, there's no point in repairing it. Yes, question. So the re repair takes place on the SS table level? Re repair takes place at the server level. So the server will, uh, let's say, have server A, B, and C. Sure. You, you read from A at consistency level one, it gives you a response. It gives you my name, right? But I actually updated my name on the, and the other servers, they haven't updated over yet. It will then go ahead and do a re repair. And if the other servers agree that my name is actually Frank and not John anymore, then re repair will fix it. So you will temporarily get hold of it. fix or go to the SS table or the fix or the Right. It will get written to a new SS table and then later on compact it. So uh, if they are a lot of queries going on and uh, would there be a lot of them uh, repair taking place and when the SS table? Yep. The question is if you're doing a lot of queries, will there be a lot of re-repair? That's up to you. Query, but it's a tunable at per table level. If you don't want any re-repair, you don't have to. Don't, no one makes you do it. It's, it's a lot of free at the same time. It might be a competition to repair the small part of the SS table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the point was if you're doing a lot of queries, a lot of re-repair, like I said, you don't have to do it. By default, it's 10% of the time, but you can say, at this table, you never do re-repair, and you always query by quorum, <coughs> and you say, I need two nodes to two out of three to agree anyway. So you don't have to worry about it. Yep. So if, if you never update, right once you never update, then there's no information you don't need to read it. Correct, yes. If you write once and you never update, uh, it is highly unlikely that you would ever need to read it. I'm maybe talking about if a node never acknowledged the initial answer, then you've been in Yes? So all this stuff's based on like, the size of the Sure. The question was how does the time stamp stay consistent across servers? You write NTP. NTPD, block to NASA. Uh, if you do not run, okay, this is very important. I didn't plan on talking about this, but if you do not run NTP, your server will be totally jacked. Do not ever run a cluster or any server production without NTP. It is, an, it is a total nightmare. You'll end up with weird issues where you delete data and then it's not gone, and then five seconds later it disappears. Or you, you delete something and then you insert something else because you were talking to different nodes, you've got conflicting timestamps, and your insert looks like it failed. Just run NTP. So, can you clarify for those who don't want to aware of NTP? Just give them a NTP is network time protocol. And it basically sits on your server and is constantly talking uh, through UDP to uh, a time server. Um, I always use the NASA one because I think we're doing that. Um, okay. yeah. But it's okay if it's not Yeah, because you, you, you always want to run UTC. Yeah, that's so, yeah. And, and it's giving you a UTC time. So even if you're not running UTC, it will uh, go ahead and convert it to your local time. And remember to check with your network computer if it's actually open. It's just running on your server, doesn't mean that it's actually working. So yes. make sure the port's still going to your firewalls or routers or whatever you need yep. on the network side to make it work. Yeah, one of the only problems I've ever had, I only had two problems with Cassandra, and they were both operator errors. They were, one was totally my fault. The other one, maybe someone else's fault. Uh, but one of the, the, the NTP one is, will hit you in the most confusing way. But even if you're not using Cassandra, and you have one server, you're gonna have a problem anyway, where you can, if, you're, if your web server is different from your database, you're gonna have really bizarre results. Um, it'll look like things are happening in the future, or like way in the past, just don't ever do it, it's terrible. So NTP for the win. 
going back to the always inside the level of faith. So when I could educate, what is the value of this idea? Right. And when the curriculum, how they look at the next? You you won't get that value of this idea. You if if you query at a, a forum, you say I need to. The question was, uh, how do I know which one is correct? Right. If you get two values of the same data, Cassandra won't return to you both rows. It will. It will. If you do a quorum, it'll look and it'll get uh, two out of three servers to respond, and it'll compare the two. Whatever row is the newest, that one wins. That's what comes back, and then it'll go ahead and repair the, the incorrect error. So if, if you error, you require all. What's that? If you require all. Not all, but it's just an error. Um, so the yes, if a server is down and you require all, then you'll get an error. If uh, you query for all, it will wait for all three to respond, fix whatever discrepancies there are, and it will still give you an answer. Um, one thing to keep in mind that I didn't talk about was the uh, the query consistency. That actually, on a write, is did the write succeed at this consistency level? So if you say write at all, and one server was down, the other two nodes will actually still get that insert, but it will return that it failed. So that's why you don't want to use all. It's like you could you could have written it, and then when that server comes up, the actually the data will be replicated. Over. So the write will have succeeded, but it will appear to you as if it failed. Um, so the last thing we're going to talk about, I kind of touched on the no integers thing. Uh, here's a small sample of the types that Cassandra supports in CQL, and there's like 15 of them or something like that. Um, basic text, integers, whatever. UUID. Time UUID is my favorite. So for those of you that don't know, time UUID is based on the UUID 1 uh, protocol. And UUID 1 includes a MAC address and a timestamp embedded within the UUID is what helps generate. When you use time UUID as your clustering key, the way that it's going to sort your data on disk is going to be based on the timestamp portion of your time UUID. So if you wanted to do comments on photos, if you make your uh, comment ID a time UID, you're going to have a nice linear uh, progression of comments uh, as if they were integers. So this is effectively, instead of using an integer, you're using the timestamp, and that's kind of how you get to sort. Yes, sir? I have a question, which was, uh, you know, there's an internal timestamp, and then there's a time UID, and if that's something you are creating yourself, and then you can see Yes, the question was, uh, where did time UID come from? Uh, in everything I did all, I generated this on the client side. Um, there are functions that you can use with Cassandra to generate time UID. I just don't know. So if you're not in your domain, you're something like events, and you're keeping track of you know, something changing, and you're doing new insults, and you're demanding that in the domain, you're relying on your own time UID, you with all the sort of queries, and you're not relying on the same they, they, yes, the question is, are you relying on Cassandra's timestamp? The timestamp is, is, is a, an additional column that's invisible and that sits on everything that you write, and it is never used for anything other than Cassandra uh, fixing consistency problems. So you can't even sort on it. It's not enough. Um, one other thing I was at in uh, Cassandra 1.2 uh, are collections. So we can do lists, maps, and sets. Uh, I don't use lists. Um, there are definitely some problems that you can get into when accessing certain elements of the list in a distributed system. It gets a little funky. Uh, I stick to maps and sets. They're predictable. They work really well. And um, I try not to put more than like 100 items in there. If you're going to do that, I would just create a separate table and follow that. So we've actually already talked about some of my uh, pro data modeling stuff. Um, how do I query my data if I can query by key? We're going to denormalize, we're going to store things 10 different ways, totally fine. Um, and as I said, the standard is built for really fast writes. So, so go ahead and write your data 10 ways, who cares? And uh, use the fast writes. Um, just take that very, very small performance hit to get really, really fast reads. And you have a system that will literally scale up to thousands of and my understanding is our largest production cluster is around 15,000 nodes. So this works. Certainly for you. So uh, my 
Thank you for inviting me to the Different Country Configuration Society of Angel Care. And uh, uh, so uh, there are different configurations like Angel Care and uh, Quorum and things like that. So are they controllable from client level, like a client vetting configuration? Yeah. So the question is, uh, are these are the different settings I've talked about controlled at a client level? Some are server level. Uh, things like testing. How often? How often my access? How often is my uh, email log testing? That's a server setting. Other things like how often is read repair? That's actually set at a table level. So you would say uh, this table has a 25 percent chance of read repair. Um, most. The only thing you're going to control at a query level or a connection level is your consistency. So I'm, I'm going to query a quorum, and that's just set on my client. I can change that for query level as well, but your connection has a default um, query consistency. When you do these uh, different writes for uh, the kind of queries that are different, are, are you actually creating two different partition keys for the same data that you're using? So the question was, are you creating two different partition keys for the same data? Um, that's, that comes back to the SS tables. Uh, Thing that I was talking about earlier, where you could have two SS tables with the same partition. When you read, it's going to have to look both. But when you, if you want to write uh, by, let's say, geography, the uh, uh, partition key for a tell, and something else like uh, data availability, that, that could be contained in a set of data of writing, let's say, 10 fields. You would write that actually to two different tables, like two different primary keys. Um, for a, for a, to, to, to help future queries by creating okay. a geography of queries by... Yeah, so the question, the question was regarding to picking your partition key. Yeah. Um, if you need to query by two of those fields, you're going to create one table for that. If, you're going to, if you have five different ways that you want to query that data, you're going to create five tables. When you do an insert, you're actually just going to insert all five tables and then you can query efficiently however you want. Um, so, that's actually all I have for, for this. Um.